experience as we have many absolutely intellectual knowledgeable and experienced people on board for today's event when opportunity before us to learn from some of the best experts in this field i hope at the end we will all have take away messages and reach with better understanding of contemporary issues related to wetland conservation and risk management before we start let me take this opportunity to acknowledge the presence of dr mukesh srivastava registrar for university director of research dr yash sharma director of extension education dr uh, ss singh dr anil kumar director of education dr sk chaturvedi dean college of agriculture dr ss kushwa university librarian all esteemed heads of departments scientists faculty members students of rani lakshmi bai central agriculture university ladies and gentlemen to start with today's event may i now request uh, dr ak pandey dean college of horticulture and forestry who is also the convener of this webinar to welcome the participants participants and brief us about the webinar please sir thank you dr jahangir bhat ji i first of all i welcome to all very distinguished participants and very noted speakers for this today's program of vande bharat on wetland conservation and management ranilakshmi bai central agriculture university under the ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare it is a central university having it two distinct college one college of agriculture and one college of horticulture and forestry this program is being organized by the college of horticulture and forestry today's topic and just yesterday's celebration of international wetland day if we say international wetland day our memory goes to this year 1971 that very important event of ramsar convention that has given the foundations and by that foundations we are celebrating to this year golden jubilee years of ramsar conventions a very humble beginning that was initiated in 1971 with the participating very few countries of the world and now that trade farm has got a good momentum good contributions and a number of organizations have come to join this ramsar conventions india has got a major benefit of this conventions and presently if we are looking to this year 42 ramsar sites in india that is one of the very good achievements in fact this year's topic wetland and water unseparable and that is very much fact that if wetland is the life so we are getting to this your precious water and in that context whether we are into this or any stream of to this your agriculture or this your forestry water is the such a precious things and how our water demand is day by day is increasing for the country's sake india where we are having world's 18 percent populations and almost 12 percent livestock populations and only 4 percent water bodies and the way there is the trend up to this your burgeoning populations and fragmentation up to this your land holding and Uh, very fast growth up to this or urbanizations in that context our requirement of this or water is increasing and in other way uh, day by day our aquifer is going to deplete it if wetlands are maintained 
certainly will be in the compatible positions for getting to this your birth or for to this your future for the future generations and for the sake of to this your man's survival or itself for to this your existence of to this your homo sapiens on to this your planet so today's topic is the very important and considering the various aspect talk to these your wetlands how these your wetlands is getting or facing to these your challenges worldwide that is the major concern for everyone whether the researchers or planners or policy makers or any common man wetlands early days we didn't put such attention that is the one of the very important or very precious unit of to this your natures everyone neglected and that has been the reasons that in this century we have lost more than 70% of this your world's wetlands and in this industrial era or having to this your last with this your a number of industrial revolutions industrial inventions and our fast modernizations that has also created a havoc to this your wetlands very survivor look it's a this your pollutants pollutants and how this your wetland is given to service to this your nature a number of very precious physiological process very precious phenomena that is that is attached to this your wetland services its uh, bioremediations phytoremediations a number of this your process how we are getting rectified nullified to this your number of toxic ends even very lethal heavy metals so one aspect and second aspect how it is recharging to this your waters up to this your grounds aquifers across to this your plants. and the way that is nurturing to this your biodiversity it is a uh, um, if uh, say to this your wetland that is the major hot spots of our flora and fauna and having to this your one of the very uh, well needed unit part to this your migratory birds and there is a unique uh, word up to this your migratory birds and a number of countries and a number of this your spots are getting it's a this your very well connected it's a this your tourism business number of hotel business number of other survivals are depend upon such type of to this your phenomena and for to this your scientists sake that is one unique uh, unit of to this your nature where our knowledge is the very major so friends this today's uh, program is a uh, very important and it is needed from a number of angles and uh, i am proud to say that uh, this university where we are organizing this one day webinar on wetland conservation and management we have got a very good uh, our uh, very important statutory officers or director research director education our counterpart dean agriculture dr chaturvedi and director extension dr ss yes, singhs all are um, having a very deep interest for such uh, this your event and friends uh, i am uh, privileged to say that uh, university's vice chancellor professor arvind kumar under uh whose dynamic leadership we are organizing this program he is a noted ac academician of to this your country very renowned 
planners, policy makers, visionary persons who have given a very uh, good thoughts for a uh, number of these your agriculture disciplines and uh, while he was into this your uh, icr as a capacity of the dg educations and presently as the vice chancellor of this uh, prestigious university of ramilaj singh vice central agriculture university so friends with this word once again i welcome to very distinguished participants who are having a very keen interest for the very burning topic of today's webinar and i also welcome to this your very uh, renowned speakers who have got a very uh, good experience very good dent on to this your today's topic friends in this uh, morning inaugural sessions uh, i have uh, very uh, i mean sir uh, Uh, good cooperation and my one of this your inaugural sessions speaker is the dr avran chalam who is the presently director at central agroforestry research institute kofri and dr ritesh kumar who is a, a very renowned person in the field of wetland wetland south asia that organizations came in the 1996 as a independent body and its headquarter at delhi and uh, the way this organizations are uh, ng um, has worked part to this your um, wetlands cause uh, that is a very remarkable and uh, um, we are very much thankful for rendering such services if you look it said to this your contributions the way they have uh, uh, made this your contributions part to this your chilka lake the way they are um, i mean so bent upon to this your uh, give a very new look and give a very important status to this your loktak lake of this your manipur this all contribution goes to this your this organizations and especially part dr ritesh kumar ji so friends uh, uh, this uh, inaugural session is having a very important speakers and uh, i welcome both the very distinguished speaker dr ritesh kumar ji and dr avran chalam ji under the dynamic leadership of our worthy vice chancellor professor arvind kumar so thanks and welcome for this inaugural session thank you very much sir uh, for putting up nicely your words about the importance of uh, uh, wetlands and the, the services they provide uh, it's really appreciable uh, we were supposed to have uh, our next speaker uh, dr a pranachalam for special address but due to his engagement maybe he is going to join us later now i would like to request dr ritesh uh, kumar director of wetland international south asia to deliver the keynote address uh, let me give uh, let me give his brief intro, intro. dr ritesh kumar is a natural resource economist by training he has ne nearly two decades of experience on wetlands of south asia specifically on the aspects of integrated management planning ecosystem services assessment and evaluation and mainstream wetlands in development he has led multidisciplinary projects on the formulation of management action plans environmental flows assessment wetlands and climate change adaptation and ecosystem based disaster risk reduction dr ritesh kumar is also a nominated member of the scientific and technical review panel of ram sar convention and a coordinating lead author at the intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services requesting uh, now i request uh, dr dinesh kumar to deliver his keynote near address please sir good morning uh, uh, everyone uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you uh, honorable uh, vice chancellor dr pandey dr dobrial uh, colleague uh, today this uh, uh, this event is uh, on uh, Uh, being held on the occasion of World Wetlands Day, 
this is the day uh, when the convention was signed and it is 50 years since the you know convention uh, has been in existence now so i'd like to uh, introduce uh, the convention to you can i request the organizers to uh, enable screen sharing so that i can share my presentation please yes sir i have sir yeah you can share sir you can share now thank you so much can you see my screen yes yes it's visible sir Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, we will uh, and just to give you a brief uh, about uh, uh, the Ramsar Convention. It is the only global treaty that focuses uh, on a single ecosystem. Um, adopted in Iran in 1971, 171 contracting parties, and most importantly, the 2400 Ramsar sites that the convention has is the largest network of protected ecosystems um, in the world. Uh, when we uh, so thereby this convention uh, is is pretty important we know wetlands by different names uh, you know even in your local colloquial language uh, we have a name for wetlands water body reservoirs water you know water logged areas beel uh, mangroves ponds mud flats dams oxbows name it these are but one ecosystem where water plays a dominating role in controlling uh, the ecosystem the plant and animal life so uh, people call that are uh, people often ask me are water bodies wetlands or are they different a uh, wetlands is a generic term uh, given to places where wet, uh, water is at surface or below surface for part of the year which then structures a kind of plant and animal community which is adapted to live in these variable hydrological conditions so all water bodies are essentially wetlands but wetlands are more than water bodies for uh, example uh, mangroves do not store water yet uh, they are a wetland category the convention came into being in 1971 has three pillars one is a list of wetlands of international importance which is ramsar site wise use in international cooperation india ratified the convention in 1982 now this is a photograph that i took out from the ramsar archives this was the day when india signed uh, the convention in 1971 the person signing the agreement uh, represents the uh, government of india and he was the then uh, you know uh, inspector uh, igf dr s a hejmadi and uh, the first conference that took place in 1971 and you can see in the front line dr salim ali himself uh, who represented along with dr s hejmadi on this conference so india was one of the initiators of uh, this convention but it was only in 1982 that we formally joined the convention at the insistence of the then prime minister uh, madam indira gandhi so why do we talk about uh, uh, ramsar site uh, as a uh, you know what is the importance of ramsar site it is a network of sites for wetlands for conservation of global biological diversity when i refer to global biological diversity i'm looking at species in the iucn red list and a, more recently on the you know with the green list of ecosystems so there is a method and approach for identifying how sites are uh, important for global biological diversity the network of 2400 sites is very diverse the largest site rio negro is of 12 million hectares in area wherein the smallest uh, you know wetland uh, that has been designated as a ramsar site is just 1 hectare it is essentially a water uh, treatment area if in if, if i look in terms of countries united kingdom has 175 sites where in countries like suriname and cyprus only have one site each the overall coverage of uh, ramsar site is about 254 million hectare which is equivalent to the size of mexico or slightly larger than mexico india has 42 sites and uh, as you will note in the last two years alone 2019 and 2020 uh, we have uh, added uh, nearly 15 sites 16 sites to our network uh, uh, and you can see uh, on the map on the left there is still a predominance uh, a higher clustering of wetlands towards the north uh, we have weak representation of ramsar sites from central india and uh, as well as certain sites such as uh, you know coral reefs 
I still do not find a representation. Now, when we, what is the idea of a network? And when you look at, so this is a map of movement of, uh, you know, radial duck in uh, in in a particular uh, a corridor in which they move, and you will see that these birds uh, they uh, breed in Mongolia, but to complete their life cycle, they will fly all the way all across China, go to Myanmar, come into our wetlands in the in the northeast, and then go back. Now, if we have to conserve this migratory species, we will have to ensure that all wetlands along the corridor are conserved. It does not make sense to apply all effort to just one site, such as Chilika Lake, unless and until countries cooperate to conserve all the wetlands, uh, the population of these species cannot be sustained. And thereby, Ramsar Convention uh, adopts a network approach. And this also applies equally to fishes and, and all that species which migrate all across. Uh, we can also look at uh, the biogeographic representation of the sites. So, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, that is why Ramsar Convention becomes a very important platform. Now, how do we know that sites are important? There are nine criteria. The first one talks about site being representative, rare or unique. So if you are looking at, uh, for example, you know, Miristika swamps of Western Ghats, they are representative and very rare. Uh, you know, wetland ecosystems, they can be designated. If I'm looking at high altitude wetlands of Himalayas, uh, uh, the biodiversity is very unique to that biogeographic zone. So it qualifies for uh, site one uh, criteria. Now there are other criteria, eight criteria, which are based on species and ecological communities. So either the wetland supports vulnerable endangered or critically endangered species as per the IUCN red list or supports population of plants and animal species important for maintaining biological diversity of a particular biogeographic region. So if you look at Western Ghats and if there are populations of amphibians, for example, which are conserving, which uh, gives a representative biological diversity to the region, it qualifies under criteria three. Or the site supports plant or animal species at a critical stage in their life cycles. So suppose a water bird is migrating and a particular wetland is used only for foraging. The birds come and eat there. That's uh, you know. But without that foraging function, the species cannot be sustained. The wetland becomes an important site. There are two additional criteria based on water birds. So if the wetland regularly supports 20,000 or more water birds, Wetlands International supports a census program. Every winter, you know, college students, professors, teachers, and, and any person from any walk of life who is able to undergo a training on water bird identification and counting uh, can join this initiative and go to a wetland and record how many water birds are there, number of species and number of individual counts. And then that data is used to validate whether a wetland uh, regularly supports 20,000 or more lands. The other criteria that we use is that if we have a population, if we have a known population is, uh, uh, you know, of a particular size, suppose I look at demoiselle cranes, and if the known population is one lakh, if a wetland has thousand or more, uh, you know, individuals of demoiselle cranes, it becomes important, globally important. There are other two criteria on fish. So if it, if the wetland has indigenous fish or um, it has a, it's an important for uh, fish spawning or breeding uh, it can be designated under criteria seven or eight and finally uh, for non-avian uh, wetland dependent taxa for example wetland dependent mammals such as otters if we have one percent of individuals or more at a site it can be designated under criteria nine so any one of these criteria if the wetland fulfills it is possible to designate them as Ramsar sites. Why do we designate? It is an opportunity to make our voice heard on an international forum on wetlands. There are no international forums on wetlands. Ramsar Convention is an international forum that we can talk, debate on issues related to wetlands. Ramsar sites have increased publicity and prestige. It is possible to garner financial support for implementation of conservation and management plans. But Ramsar is also an important uh, you know, resource to access latest information and guidance. You can log into Ramsar Site Information Service, RSIS on the website, and you can extract polygons, GIS layers, species list, and whatever information has been given by governments is available on that website. And it also provides a platform for international cooperation. For example, on the right, you see a map of two Ramsar sites, 
uh, which share an international border. These are the two sides are on the right side is Bangladesh Sundarbans and on the left side is Indian Sundarbans. Now, since both of these are Ramses sites and they will all be trying to achieve wise use, uh, you know, they can cooperate with each other. What are our responsibilities? Our responsibility once a site is declared as a Ramses site, we have to put in management, which is conforming to wise use. And I'll discuss wise use later on. Every six years, we have to provide an assessment of the site and ensure that there is no adverse change. If there is an adverse change, we have to report to the secretariat and undertake ameliorative measures immediately. Now, what is wise use? Normally, you know, for management of any ecosystems, the approach that we take is that if you take the stressor away from uh, the uh, from from the ecosystem, if the stressor is removed, the nature will heal itself through a succession process. It will try to uh, re-establish the balance. For wetlands, uh, this approach doesn't work because it is actively receiving nutrients. It is actively receiving sediments. It's pretty dynamic. It's open system. It cannot be closed. So some level of human interference is actually very positive for the system. So some level of harvesting of nutrients, either in the form of, you know, vegetation or fish or some cleaning of inlets and outlets is required to sustain most of the ecosystem types, except Himalayas, wherein, uh, you know, they are very, you know, they, they, uh, they are, uh, you know, very pristine. In other systems, humans are an integral part of the system. So wise use is a strategy wherein we can use the wetland on sustainable basis, which does not change the uh, type of the wetland ecosystem. So if we use, for example, if I take a lake, if I take a natural uh, lake, we can do an agriculture in the lake when it is dry without creating any embankments, without storing water. If we do not change the natural hydrological character or we bring in more pesticides, we introduce invasive species, it is perfectly okay with the ecosystem. It should not change the basic character of the system. So it is a wise use when wetland structure and functions are maintained and its full range of benefits are maintained. It is unwise when the functions are altered adversely or some ecosystem services are enhanced while others are diminished. So some thumb rules, if we reduce water, any activity that reduces water flowing into the wetland, which reduces the area under inundation, which reduces the shoreline, which fragments the wetlands, which reduces the water holding capacity, uh, leads to water quality deterioration, reduction in uh, diversity of native species. All of these activities are unwise use of the wetland. Now, there are national rules. We have wetlands conservation and management rules. Any Ramsar site that is uh, designated uh, also complies with wetlands conservation and management rules. And they say that there are a number of activities which are prohibited in a Ramsar site. We cannot convert a Ramsar site. No industry can be set up. Manufacture or handling or storage or disposal of construction and demolition waste, solid waste, discharge of untreated sewage. There are a number of activities which cannot be done. But there are certain activities which can be done with regulation. So subsistence level biomass harvesting, including traditional agriculture or fisheries can be done until a certain level. Treated sewage can be discharged, but under permission from an authority. Culture fisheries practices in private land is permissible only when uh, practices are sustainable. So there are you know, ways and means of determining what is uh, sustainable or not. Uh, the government provides a guideline. And we can, under those regulated conditions, use the wetland. There are a number of activities which are permitted. So ecological rehabilitation activities, inventory, research, communication, management, habitat management, community-based ecotourism, harvesting of wetland products within regenerative capacity, all of these activities are permitted. Now, does Ramsar site designation make a difference? I'll give you some case studies. One of them is East Calcutta wetlands, the government therein. Now, these wetlands are essentially an assemblage of sewage-fed fish farms, and uh, they filter waste of the city. Now, state of West Bengal mooted a proposal for establishing a World Trade Center by reclaiming parts of East Calcutta wetland. A public interest litigation was filed in 1992 and wetland conservation was denied. And not only that, the, uh, the judgment called for establishment of East Calcutta Wetlands Conservation and Management Act. Now, when you read the judgment, the justice has clearly written, I do not find any justifiable reason to disagree with the opinions expressed by environmentalists that wetlands should be preserved and no interference or reclamation. 
if i look into koleru lake in andhra pradesh this is a beautiful wetland within the deltas of krishna and godavari it was converted into a hub of aquaculture now supreme court took cognizance and ordered demolition of more than 1600 ponds producing worth 300 crore of fish annually so there are you know examples in chilika aquaculture was being done almost 106 square kilometer were used under aquaculture everything was demolished in 2018 so there are legal provisions in which any non wetland use or any unwise use can be regulated in a wetland what are the principles of managing wetlands we have to use a systems thinking catchment scale management adaptive management and collaborative decision making when i say systems thinking we have to think not just of the water plant and animal life we also have to think of people and their relationship with wetland in this uh, photograph that i give you from uh, one of the wetlands in bihar if this gentleman does not harvest fish or vegetation the succession process in the wetland when ensure that this will convert itself into a football field so the livelihoods become an integral part of wetland management that has to be seen in the system catchment scale management calls for looking at the entire catchment entire landscape in which wetland is located so in this case uh, this is a catchment map of uh, vembanad estuary i see namir here uh, so i am sure uh, namir sir will talk about coal lands beautiful coal lands but unless we take a catchment view of these wetlands it is very hard to ensure sustenance of these wetlands adaptive management now you know as students of ecology we might feel that we know everything about the wetland but every management that you do is limited by our ability to understand how wetlands function i'll give you a case of bharatpur now bharatpur Uh, uh, was and is still one of a very highly biodiverse areas in Rajasthan. It attracts more than 180 to 200 species of uh, you know different kinds of birds uh, that come in here. And in 1970, it was declared as a protected area. In 1970, uh, when Madam Indira Gandhi visited the area, she was very perplexed by number of buffaloes grazing in the national park, and she ordered construction of a stone wall so to prohibit uh, you know cattle grazing. when the stone wall was constructed there was an important change that happened in the wetland the park gradually saw increased growth of paspalum the grasses which were being earlier eaten up by buffaloes they started growing vigorously and the wetland started changing its character from an open marsh area to into a vegetated grassland now with this learning the management has been modified and control grazing is now a part of park management so we need to continuously monitor and see how wetland responds to different kinds of management and finally collaborative decision making no single department no single you know uh, vision can enable wise use wise use is a collective vision of different stakeholders and sectors put together normally we see that you know we can claim that forest department is alone is sufficient to manage a wetland perhaps no uh, you know there are intricacies in water management fisheries energy all these sectors uh, need to uh, you know uh, their views and visions need to be brought together and then the collective vision becomes a pathway for wise use i'll quickly touch upon aspects of governance now as per wetlands conservation and management rules state wetland authorities have been set up in each of these states which are the nodal institutions for all policy and regulation mat uh, regulation matters but the trick lies in blending formal and informal institutions i will give you a case of chilika development authority on the left you can see the formal structure you can see the chairman as chief minister and when uh, honorable navin patnaik uh, sits in a meeting and when he says that okay i don't want any nonsense happening in chilika whatever sectoral proposals you have it should not affect adversely affect the wetland i think most of the intersectoral issues are settled there but on the right you will see how chilika development authority collaborates with more than 50 different kind of institutions there are research institutions international organizations community based organizations state government departments and this is all informal but if there is any problem they can always reach out to a college they will reach out to nrsa they will reach out to icar to understand what is happening to their wetland and blend that knowledge with management so the use of mix of formal and informal institutions is critical for management in uttar pradesh this is one you know divisional magistrate who was posted and he suddenly uh, in sitapur and he suddenly realized that you know the wetlands are drying up but they are drying more because of silt and sewage that comes in from neighboring settlements 
Now, he did not go into a lot of, uh, you know, monitoring and science, but he intelligently uh, used the existing funds under Manrega, total sanitation campaign. In those days, it was not Swachh Bharat, total sanitation campaign to address the root causes of degradation. And over a period of two or three years that he was there, these wetlands have restored and become breeding grounds of Saras Crane. Now, this model tells us that conservation problems need not always be solved by money that is given by Ministry of Environment, Forest, or any conservation agency. Even developmental funds can be intelligently used to uh, you know, restore a wetland. So ultimately, the message that I want to give that it is important to understand what is the condition of the wetland. If it is a pristine wetland, not doing something is important. We just monitor. If it is highly degraded, we need a full-fledged restoration. And doing nothing in a wetland, just observing a wetland is also an important management decision. At times, our interventions can spoil a wetland. People, you know, I have seen forest departments planting trees inside a wetland. Plantation is a good activity, but plantation inside a wetland can attract more silt and kill a wetland very quickly. So not doing something or doing something very carefully is, is important. Climate change is, is bringing a lot of changes to our wetlands. That means we cannot reconstruct our conservation planning based on our vision of wetlands as they existed in 1970s or 80s or any pre-disturbance stage. Climate change means that, you know, stationarity-based management approaches are increasingly limiting. We will have to continue to monitor and factor in climate change in our management strategies. However, the condition of Ramses sites, all Ramses site is not that great. This is one photograph from Deepar Bill wherein active waste dumping is taking place or one recent case in Kashmir in a Ramses site wherein hydrological management was done, but that management ended up draining the wetland instead of uh, you know, uh, maintaining the natural regime. So at close, you know, I wouldn't say Ramses sites are in best of their health in the country, but they are, our, I would say, global, our global responsibility. They are international biodiversity jewels and they should be maintained as such. Designation is just the beginning. It is about meeting our wise use commitments wherein our success lies and well-managed Ramsar sites can set good benchmarks for all veterans. So with this, uh, I would like to uh, conclude and uh, hand the mic back to the chair of the session. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much uh, for your informative address, uh, Dr. Rupesh Kumar on how, how you designate, uh, you have told us how we designate the, what is the criteria for designation of wetlands and how we do manage wetlands. But at the end, what I got from your uh, uh, keynote address is that uh, we need to be a responsible citizen, I guess. And that is what the message was all over and how ethical we are uh, looking into our surrounding. And uh, uh, apart from that, uh, you have also mentioned in your address that there are 2,400 sites all over the world. And uh, we are having, uh, luckily India is having 42. That is also a big number if you see the globe. So uh, we appreciate your uh, you know, efforts in, in, uh, in, 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 in taking these uh, kind of things forward. And as academicians and researchers, we are also trying to do things like training human resources from the universities so that the people uh, will be aware of what we are doing. So we really thank you for an election by Central American University is really thankful uh, to you and your efforts and your team's efforts. Thank you very much, sir. I think uh, uh, I will, I like to mention here, one of the reasons uh, why I, I always wanted to speak with you is to invite uh, uh, you know institutions uh, engaging with you know higher education teaching uh, to urge you to incorporate wetlands into your curriculum you know there is no place where you can study or learn about wetlands you know i had a degree in economics from delhi university it is only by practical training uh, that I could learn about wetlands. You can do zoology, you can do botany, but there is no place, no academic institution, no course where you can understand or study about wetlands. You study about forests, you study about water, you study about limnology, ecology, but wetlands as a subject is yet to find a place in academic curriculum. So I'll urge you, and especially, you know, you are, uh, you know, very appropriate institutions 
to consider incorporating wetlands in your academic uh, you know teaching we are very much happy and we give you uh, our promise to render all support in developing required material case studies field work even you know internship to students who are willing to continue working in this area so that is a humble submission thank, thank you, you very much, much sir uh, i think uh, uh, the academicians who are present right now they have already taken note of this but i will uh, update you uh, since we are teaching uh, from uh, many years uh, here in other universities earlier we do teach about wetlands whereby forestry curriculum is concerned but still uh, the, the uh, uh, what you have said it is going to be taken by uh, note uh, uh, and maybe you will see the difference in so on and uh, now let us have the pleasure of listening to the most awaited presidential address from the chief patron of this mm-hmm. event honorable vice chancellor uh, mm-hmm. ranlakshmi bai central education mm-hmm. university mm-hmm. professor arun kumar uh, mm-hmm. please sir mm-hmm. yeah अपॉर्चुनिटी टू शेयर माई व्यूज विद रेस्पेक्ट टू दैटलैंड कंजर्वेशन एंड मैनेजमेंट एंड congratulate uh, dr pande dr manmohan and his team for uh, organizing this very important webinar today which is pertinent because we are celebrating 50 years of ramsar convention the convention which was mm-hmm. 1971 held uh, in ha uh, iran ramsar in iran long with the caspian sea almost 50 years back and india is a signatory to ramsar convention on wetlands and the india has also drafted the wetland rules in 2010 considering the significance and importance of wetlands as you know that type kar doge india detail karenge has got 42 ramsar sites and uh, this year the concern is and the pledge is to conserve and wisely use our wetlands and water is the key concern so only yesterday we had world wetlands day and this was also celebrated in the university and on this world wetlands day water has been the key theme now you know that when we call it wetland it is a distinct ecosystem and uh, this ecosystem which is flooded by water it could be permanently it could be it could be permanently or it could be seasonally and it is characterized by the vegetation of aquatic plants 
which is adapted mostly the plants are adapted to the unique hydric soils now you know that we have more inland wetlands uh, being 69% and the coastal uplands wetlands are 27% now if we talk about these wetlands there are unique example which has been just given by dr ritesh kumar director wetland international south asia and uh, huh? and uh, these just wait wait a minute ha bol lijiye dwara refresh karna padega time lagega ha okay let me continue so these wetlands in india particularly if we talk about one to five the area it is in different locations one to five percent of the geographical area is spread under the wetlands the area is about 58.3 million hectares and 75% of this is just the paddy fields so if we talk about the paddy fields where the water is inundated for most of the time this is also taken into consideration but if we define the permanent wetlands which constitute about 4.7% of the geographical area of the country and india as i told you has 42 ramsar sites and these ramsar sites have a you know unique characteristics to conserve it to preserve it but there are certain other measures for livelihood security as it has been pointed out by dr ritesh kumar these uh, water bodies are to be utilized for different purposes now the you know that the wetlands are formed because you know the surface water accumulation of surface water and less than 1% of the water on the earth is usable fresh water and most of it is stored in the wetlands and these wetlands not only promote the flood protection by storing the water but also provide recreational opportunities opportunity for rearing fish wildlife habitats and this is the most productive ecosystem of the world can be compared to rainforests and uh, it houses a number of microbes plants insects amphibians reptiles birds fish and mammals so many such species are the you know part of the wetlands and as per an estimate 40% of the world species live or breed in the wetlands but what is happening slowly and slowly these wetlands because of the encroachment because of the polluted water because of the drainage of the sewage water and the city waste these water bodies are become polluted and almost 90% of the world's wetlands have been destroyed since 1700 and these have been disappearing 
faster than the forests and are also the many species almost 25% of the all wetland species face extinction and if it is not conserved and protected maybe in near future many more species may become extinct now the climate change is also and the biodiversity loss is also a big concern and uh, these wetlands to some extent help to impact the climate change and uh, rather tackle the climate change and also are the source of fresh water and also many plants like blueberries or cranberries or selfies or even timbers wild rice even some medicinal plants some of the you know popular uh, you can see the birds like ducks or falcon and many more the species as i pointed out that almost 40% of the world species live or breed in the wetlands so in order to save these wetlands in order to conserve these wetlands as per the draft rules prepared in 2010 we need to observe this we need to create more awareness we need to also take suitable measures and i was just uh, you know listening to dr ritesh kumar who was emphasizing that it should be taught in a course i am sure this would have been included and must be included if not in a course because wetlands are very important for the human mankind and also the having you know wild life habitats very important so depending upon the you know landscape shape geology movement and abundance of, of water it helps uh, in determining the plants and animal that in habitat in each wetlands and these wetlands differ one from the another for example you know in india because of the different climatic situations these wetlands is spreading from ladakh to down south in tamil nadu so naturally the wetlands in ladakh may not have similar characteristics as in case of the tamil nadu or many in east and the best the unique example we have talked about is the lok tak lake in north east which is the largest as a floating park and a uh, lot of uh, you know people earn their livelihoods out of these uh, you know island type in lok tak lake different places similarly many other lakes as it has been pointed out chilka lake or many such lakes which are available but because of the encroachment because of the uh, policies by local bodies perhaps these wetlands are not receiving adequate attention as it should have been even in the water side areas lot of emphasis has been given in water said which you know is a geographical area in which water sediments and dissolved material drain from higher elevation to a low lying outlets or basin a point on a larger stream 
or a lake. So these water sites, improvement in the water sites can also serve as a, you know, protectant for saving the water, conserving the water, and also ultimately utilizing it for the agricultural purposes. So today, when we are celebrating the wetlands, uh, you know, World Wetlands Day yesterday, and we need to discuss more and more how we can conserve what are the rules, what are the guidelines provided by the government of India, and what are the unique success stories to conserve and preserve these wet wetlands as in case of the UP, an example has been shown whereby by using the Manrega program, the wetlands have again been revived. So there is a need to revive these wetlands. Almost uh, every village used to have a pond. And uh, now the pond which used to be a point of collection of water, where the water used to be drained, have almost vanished in most of the villages. And this has really resulted in a lot of, you know, adverse situations. Ultimately, our objective is how to have more availability of water. And you know, water is becoming a, a scarce commodity. As you know, the per capita availability of water, which was around 18, 16 or so, in 2001, it has reduced to below the threshold level of 1700 cubic meter per capita per annum in 2007, and is going to further reduce by 1220 by 2050. And that will be the place where we will have a scarce or absolute water scarcity. About one fifth of our population would be, uh, you know, having no drinking water. And at that stage, we need to think from now onwards that how to improve the availability of water and also revive the ponds, improve the water sets, improve the water bodies, many places it is treated, or define and redefine the Ramsar sites, like in Kevla Dev National Park in Bharatpur, you know, a lot of birds, Siberian birds come and it has become a very important tourist destination. The economy of that particular district is dependent on the Kevla Dev National Park, the bird century. So this way, these places could be the places where a lot of, uh, you know, Sub people can earn their livelihood and also provide a preferred destination for most of the tourists, not only Indian, but foreign. Many people, they come and visit these places, like the example of Chilka Lakes have been given, or a different, as I've mentioned, a different sites. So today, when we are organizing, uh, I think we are timely are doing this exercise to educate the people and make aware of the role of the, uh, the uh, water bodies. And with the deliberations of a number of speakers, I think we will be more wiser and we will certainly make awareness amongst the people. And also the way forward through which we can 
improve the availability of water either by improving the storage or by reducing the pouring of sewage water from different parts and making these water bodies clean and a enabling environment for the different plant species different kinds of fish and also different kinds of habitats so with these words i thank once again the organizers for organizing this i am organizing this very important webinar on the occasion of celebration of 50th anniversary of ramsar and uh, india can certainly take a lead in this direction also these areas can be developed as a tourist hot spot so that we can further generate more and more resources and also make an these uh, hot spots as a uh, you know preferred destination for it so thank you very much for inviting me today and i hope that this seminar will give you lot of points for discussions which you can carry forward and make the people aware to conserve and preserve these wetlands in the country thank you very much thank you sir thank you so much for your interesting and illuminating talk sir your advice and sharing profound knowledge with us is a driver of motivation always Uh, sir, you have this morning nicely conveyed your message about the significance of wetlands, whether it's near coastal, uh, backwater, or it's uh, freshwater wetlands. <coughs> so it will be a great pleasure for us to listen to you again in our future endeavors. Uh, we owe you a special vote of thanks for honoring this virtual gathering with your presence in your hectic schedule, and it's worthwhile to mention that. Our honourable vice chancellor has already initiated uh, some of the uh, activities related to wetlands in our campus. So we are in, uh, we have developed some, and we are still uh, in a working phase of some of the small wetlands which are used in our farm as well as. And we have seen some of the changes after we have developed these. Uh, there, there are some bird-like fauna. Can you see? Thank you very much, sir, for your time today. Now that we are coming to the end of this inaugural session, may I request Professor uh, M. J. Dobria, who convened of this event and head of Forestry College of Agriculture and Forestry, Rani Lakshmi Bai, Agriculture University, to propose a vote of thanks. Hello. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, uh, audible. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, so thank you, Dr. Bhat. uh so this uh, we came at the end of the this inaugural session and uh, i propose the vote of thanks so first of all uh, i thank to the president of this uh, uh, ngp patron of this uh, this webinar uh, our honorable vice chancellor and uh, he uh, in detail explained about all the uh, utility of the wetlands Well, the, giving the importance on the different uh, kinds of wetlands and also the uh, the program to be initiated for the revival of the wetlands. He also uh, uh, also uh, endorsed the statement by Dr. Ritesh that uh, we should have the program on this uh, wetland uh, aspect in the course curriculum, and that may be. and future can be added though we have in our forestry especially program we have the uh, wildlife management and uh, wildlife uh, courses uh, this kind of uh, component but uh, a separate can be added later stages and uh, sir also mention about the story of the kevla dev park 
So where the, not only for the conservation purpose, but also the livelihood of the locals is depend on those parts. So wetlands, not only just for as ecological means, but also socioeconomic developments. So thank you, sir, you spare your time and uh, you encourage us to host this uh, webinar. So I thank you very much for you, for this, your kind gesture and uh, gracing the occasion. I also thank uh, Dr. Rit uh, Dr. Ritesh, Director Wetlands International South Asia, uh, uh, who uh, agreed our uh, uh, to uh, miss for this keynote address on the, the uh, on this occasion, and uh, he also mentioned out the uh, the different methods or processes of the designation of uh, the wetlands, what is the criteria and all, and how. Uh, people can be made awareness because uh, my main aim is to make the aware of the people and uh, we hope uh, <coughs> we will in touch and uh, our students will be benefited some kind of as you say there's some kind of internship or some kind of studies can be taken on wetlands with collaboration with the, your organizations and thank you sir for uh, uh, delivering on this uh, uh, inaugural session and uh, enlightening us I also thank uh, our uh, Dean, Dr. A.K. Pandey and convener of this uh, webinar uh, who meticulously planned this and uh, uh, suggested to host this uh, webinar. And uh, right from the beginning, he uh, selecting the resource person and uh, making the all arrangements. So I thank you, sir, for uh, motivating us to uh, take this seminar, this uh, webinar to host. and. Uh, he also uh, mentioned historical background of this wetland uh, Ramsar Convention and also <clears throat> the importance of the wetlands. Uh, though he is a horticulturist, but he is very much uh, engaged with the natural <laughs> uh, resource conservation and especially the wetlands is uh, one of the uh, his favorite topic. So maybe in the afternoon we will listen his more uh, deliberation on the how he can link the wetlands with the, uh, this horticulture. So thank you, sir. And uh, though we were having a special uh, address from Dr. Ayan Machalam, Director Kafri, but somehow he was not able to connect with us uh, due to his some uh, preoccupied work. But uh, maybe uh, later stage he may, may join. So I thank him for this uh, uh, for this uh, uh, special address in absentia also. I also thanks all the dean directors, uh, head of departments of our uh, university uh, who uh, attended this program in this inaugural session and uh, uh, who also help us to uh, organize this uh, webinar. I also thank all the faculty members, all the participants and uh, all the resource persons who may be joining in later on, Dr. P.O. Amir, we will listen uh, next in technical session, Dr. P. Shivkumar, uh, Dr. Prashant Sivastav and uh, uh, some of other may be joining to us. So I thank you all uh, for uh, this inaugural session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention and patience. Down the line, we have now uh, it's time to attend knowledge of wisdom. Huh? We'll, uh, we'll move to our technical sessions. Uh, Professor P.O. Namin, Dean College of Climate Change and Environment Science, Kerala Agricultural University, Kerala. He is also South Asian Coordinator in situ Conservation Breeding Specialist Group, SSC IUCN. State Coordinator, Asian uh, Water Bird Census and State Coordinator, Indian Bird Conservation Network and Important Bird Area Program. Ladies and gentlemen, we rarely get this up kind of opportunity to listen to the words of great knowledge of the speaker. Professor Namir is going to talk on bird, bird monitoring as a tool for conservation of wetlands. I would like to invite you, sir, to deliver your valuable talk. Please, sir. Okay, uh, sir, am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, carry on. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, good morning, uh, all of you. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor for the prestigious university, Professor Arvind Kumar, sir. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Dobrial, professor, and you know who invited me to, uh, to join this uh, national webinar with all of you. Uh, professor 
Jahangir Ebert, uh, Dr. A.K. Pandey, other uh, professors and learned colleagues, uh, and uh, distinguished uh, other guests and viewers. A uh, very uh, good morning to all of you. Well, I would first like to you know, congratulate the organizers for uh, choosing a topic of very high relevance uh, for this webinar, the wetland conservation. You know, we have been uh, listening from uh, various speakers today, the significance of wetland conservation and you know, um, uh, we have had this Ramsar Convention for the last five decades now. And you know, we will just examine uh, the status of our wetlands in this backdrop. So with your permission, I will uh, you know, share my screen. I have a brief presentation. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so um, uh, I have been asked to talk about the bird monitoring as a tool for conservation of wetlands. A case study from Coal Wetlands, which is a Ramsar site in Kerala. So this is what uh, you know, I'll be speaking about for the next 20, 25 minutes. Uh, okay, this is uh, the outline of my talk. I'll be giving an overview of the wetland, the wetland types, the values, the Ramsar wetlands, the long-term long -term monitoring at coal wetlands, the conservation challenges and some uh, recommendations. But I don't need to uh, explain to this August body uh, what a wetland is. It's been very precisely and clearly uh, defined by the Ramsar Convention, which does define wetland as areas of marsh. It can be natural, artificial. It can be permanent or temporary. And with water that is static, flowing, fresh, brackish, salt, including areas of marine water, the depth of which at low tide does not exceed six meters. So, you know, this definition of Ramsar Convention on the wetland is very comprehensive and that does encompass all the uh, aspects of wetland. And it's a very uh, good definition proposed by the Ramsar Convention. Uh, the wetland types, we do have different types of wetlands uh, in India. Uh, again, you know, as per the classification of Ramsar Convention, which include shallow sea, rocky sea coast and sea cliff, uh, sea beaches, freshwater ponds, freshwater lakes, estuaries and backwaters, reservoirs of dams, swamp forests, mangrove forests, and the rice field. The values of the wetlands, uh, well, uh, uh, Dr. Ritesh, did uh, speak, uh, uh, um, did highlight the values of the wetland in his lecture, so not uh, getting into the details. But then as uh, uh, has been indicated by the previous speakers, the theme of 2021 World Wetland Day is wetlands and water. So, I mean, it's not uh, the, you know, wetland does have several values, including the biodiversity, socioeconomic and other aspects. But the one value that I would like to highlight is the wetland and the water. You know, it does, it is these wetlands that ensure the freshwater availability for the millions of people across the globe. So <coughs> that I would say is one of the most important value of the wetland. And wetland also help in checking flood during the monsoon, checking drought during the summer, because you know it does act as a, it's a it, it does you know play an important role in maintaining the hydrological cycle of the region. It does um, um, you know help in checking the salt water ingression from the sea, particularly the coastal wetlands. It's an important important role that is played by the wetland. You know it, wetlands are regarded as a kidney of an ecosystem. It does you know perform the act of you know cleaning 
the, uh, the, the, the wastewater. So it, it does act like a wastewater treatment plant. That's when it's regarded as a uh, kidney of the nature, nature's kidney. And it also acts as important habitat for the various forms of biological diversity. And it also is important from the food security point of view, particularly, you know, I said about the paddy fields. And, you know, it is these paddy fields, you know, which does feed uh, the, uh, you know, the, the people of the world. So, you know, it has a, a food security value as well. Well, socioeconomic value, I did mention, you know, this is one uh, socioeconomic valuation that we did do in one of the wetlands out here in Kerala, the coal wetlands, which is a Ramsar site. Um, you know, it uh, is um, uh, the coal wetland, you know, annually, it just being remaining as the wetland, it generate close to, you know, 13 lakhs um, uh, mandates of job, and it produce, uh, you know, it generate an income to the tune of, you know, 17.3 crore. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, I mean, when we uh, speak, about wetland conservation to the decision makers, you know, how much we speak about the ecology or biodiversity, it may not, you know, uh, fully convince the policy makers, but when you talk in terms of, you know, socioeconomic valuation, they do, you know, definitely listen. And, you know, that's why, you know, we thought of, you know, doing this socioeconomic valuation and it does actually work in that way. Well, coming to the Ramsar wetland, we share again, you know, um, um, uh, Dr. Ritesh has detailed about the uh, Ramsar wetlands and its criteria. But then, you know, I would like to highlight two, uh, you know, out of the nine broad criteria that is listed by Ritesh, the two most important, most important in the sense of the two quantitative criteria are using the water birds, is, uh, which are like, you know, any wetland that regularly support more than 20,000 water individuals of water bird and any wetland that support more than 1% of the global population, any one species of water bird, you know, there are two quantitative criteria uh, that's been used to designate any uh, um, you know, site as a Ramsar wetland. And uh, well, this also has been said by the previous speakers, we in India, we do have 42 Ramsar sites, but, uh, and you know, this is how it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, located in different parts of the country. This again has been highlighted by Ritesh. Yes, um, I mean, uh, all of our uh, Ramsar sites are, you know, confined to the Northern India, but you know, the, whether it's South, Central, East and West, I think, you know, there is scope for having, you know, more uh, Ramsar sites. Uh, because for a country like India, uh, such a huge country like India, you know, 42 is completely inadequate. And in this, in this context, you know, I would like to uh, bring to your uh, attention a publication that is brought out by the Bombay Natural History Society on the potential and existing Ramsar sites of India. This was published way back in 2005, wherein they list close to 400, you know, potential Ramsar sites from India. And it's all documented and it's, uh, it's the information is available. So 42, you know, I don't think it's a big number uh, for a, a country to the magnitude of India, you know, we should definitely have, you know, more number of Ramsar sites. Okay, now coming to the wetland birds um, in India, uh, we got uh, out of the 1,335 uh, species of bird, uh, uh, you know, close to, you know, a quarter of them are uh, wetland dependent uh, birds and uh, of which you know um, uh, uh, close to 50 percent or you know 40 percent are long distance migrants okay i um, in the next few slides you know i'll uh, quickly take you over a tour on a representation of the some of the water birds seen in our country a uh, couple of species of ducks here lesser whistling duck and the pink pink tail duck the little grape and the greater flamingo the indian mohan and the purple swam hen the coot and the white breasted water hen, the black pinstails and the oyster catchers, the golden plovers and the painted snipes, the painted stalk and the black stalk. Okay, so I mean, that's just a cross section of the one of the uh, biodiversity elements that we do have in our wetlands. But please understand that you no know, birds are not the only biodiversity element that is being present in our wetlands, you know, uh, you take any uh, taxa, uh, whether it is uh, mammals or birds or reptiles or amphibians or uh, fishes or invertebrates or plants, 
you know, our wetlands do support incredible biodiversity of all these taxa. Well, coming to the uh, long-term monitoring of water birds of Paul wetlands, you know, this has been the case study that I would like to uh, highlight today, you know, how the long-term monitoring has, has been helping the conservation of, you know, wetlands. Okay, so coal wetlands is one of the largest wetlands located in the central, uh, central Kerala in the Trishu district, uh, which has a total extent of 13,000 hectares, 130 square kilometers closely. And this blue part uh, is a uh, uh, coal wetland and it is spread over two different uh, districts in uh, central Kerala. So, um, 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 this is, uh, and you know, this incidentally is a Ramsar site, which was declared as a Ramsar site in 2002, 18, 18 to 19 years from now. Okay. Well, we've been uh, monitoring uh, the birds of coal wetlands uh, since 1992, close to last three decades, uh, we have been monitoring the birds of coal wetlands. So this is a, uh, what is being shown here is a total number of individuals of the birds of coal wetlands of the last uh, three uh, decades. You know, um, the bird population has mostly been fluctuating. However, if you look at the, uh, this graph, it's very clear that all the last few years, well, for the last three, and three to four years, there has been a steady decline in the total number of birds. So this is a matter of uh, concern, I would say. And, you know, um, we also did look at uh, the uh, population, uh, flex, I mean, population pattern of uh, different groups of birds. So uh, one of the great, uh, biggest uh, uh, contribution of bird fauna in tall wetlands or any wetland that for, uh, matter is the ducks. So the ducks constitute the largest uh, uh, contribute contribution. And uh, in, in the case of duck also, all the last you know, few years, the population has been on the decline. So then we specifically looked at the different species of ducks. Then we found that uh, the lesser whistling duck um, you know, also followed the similar pattern. You can see the population, the, uh, the trend graph, which is on the decline. The, the pot, cotton pygmy goose on the, on the contrary, um, um, uh, over the last you know, uh, few years, the population has been on the increase. And cotton pygmy goose, it is not a threatened species. However, a recent uh, analysis that was done by the uh, 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 close to 10 organizations uh, within the country to uh, uh, analyze the, or to bring out the status of the uh, birds of India called, that, uh, called, that, called as, a publication called as State of Indian Birds, and in the state of Indian bird publication, about which I'll be speaking a little later, uh, coot or the cotton pygmy goose has been, you know, uh, noted as one of the species uh, whose population has been on the decline at the national level. However, in coal wetlands, uh, it's doing better, which is a good news. Uh, Gargeni, uh, which is a migratory uh, duck uh, that comes to uh, India, including Kerala from uh, uh, Eurasia, its uh, population is also on the decline. The trend is to the uh, downtrend. Uh, the rallies, on the other hand, uh, the trend has been um, on the increase. Um, well, and you know, when we looked at uh, 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 what it could be, then we realized that the gray-headed swamp hen, whose population has been very low towards uh, uh, initial stages when we uh, started the survey, has been you know, on, the, uh, on, on the steady increase. Uh, so that could be you know, uh, reflected in the rallied group also because in you know, other rallies, the population has been more or less stable. However, uh, the Grehert Swam Hen is the one you know, that has really taken the rallied population on the increase. However, uh, for the last you know, uh, three, four years, again, you know, there has been a decline even in the population of the gray-headed swamp hen. Shorebirds, uh, the general trend uh, has been on the rise, but the you know, last you know, three, four years, again, you know, uh, the population is towards a uh, downside. Uh, the gulls and terns, um, uh, there has been a drastic decline 
in the um, uh, population trend, uh, uh, as, as is evidenced from this uh, graph. And, and you know, one of the uh, individual uh, species which contribute to the uh, bulk of the, uh, um, you know, larid uh, population is a whisker tern. And when we look at the population of the whisker tern, the whisker tern population also has been, you know, on the sharp, dis sharp dis decline. So, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, the population uh, trend of, you know, many of the species show. Well, stocks, uh, uh, there, are, there is some good news. Uh, the, uh, the overall trend over the last three decades is on the rise. However, over the last, you know, uh, four, five, uh, six years, it's been uh, again, you know, on the decline. So uh, though uh, general trend of the three decades is uh, to the higher side, but uh, off late, and for the last, you know, uh, uh, six to seven years, the population has been on the decline. Uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the Ibises, uh, two species of Ibises uh, are shown here. Uh, again, you know, um, over, the, over the period, you know, the, there has been increase in the number of Ibises in Kerala. Uh, but, uh, you know, last few years, again, you know, the population has been not uh, doing very good. Uh, when compared to the, some of the previous years. Uh, darter, which incidentally is a threatened species of bird according to IUCN status, uh, the population of darter is quite good as far as you know, Kerala is concerned, uh, which, is, which is actually a, a good news. Um, two species of cormorants are uh, depicted here in this population frame here. The po population of uh, the Indian shag uh, or the Indian cormorant is on the increase how the population of um, uh, in little cormorant, which is on the rise, but you know, again, during the last three, four years, you know, it's been uh, to the downside. Um, Heron zegrids and bittern, which, you know, are the, one of the commonest group of birds in any of the wetland. Uh, though the population trend uh, has been on the higher side, the general pattern of, you know, the population decline over the last a uh, few years is uh, clearly evident in the case of uh, uh, the RDDA members also. Uh, well, uh, here is shown the couple of uh, species of egrets, the little egret and the cattle egret. Um, again, you know, it is also following the general uh, population pattern. The pond heron, one of the commonest uh, bird of, you know, any of our wetland, uh, though the general trend is uh, to the uh, higher side, the, you know, general pattern uh, as has been seen in the case of, you know, other species of birds over the last three, four years is uh, 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 shown in the case of Pond Heron also. Okay, um, over the last uh, uh, five years, since 2014, you know, we have been using a slightly different uh, methodology to uh, count the uh, birds in our wetlands. We have been uh, using eBird uh, app, mobile application. So uh, until now, uh, the data that I have shown is based on the data that we have gathered as part of the Asian Waterbird Census, which is being uh, organized at the national level by the Wetlands International. Uh, uh, but uh, that's uh, using a, a single uh, day data, or you know, it's collected uh, only during the month of January. Uh, that's uh, how the Asian Waterbird Census is happening across the. Uh, Asian countries. Uh, so uh, when we switched over to the eBird, you know, uh, which actually facilitated a more intensive monitoring. So this is the uh, monitoring that we have done since that we have been doing since 2014. So what is sh shown here is the, the values here are the number of uh, checklists, which means, you know, a number of independent observations that we have taken across these years. For example, in 2014, uh, we have taken 439 observations from coal wetlands alone. Uh, 2015, it is 987. 2016, it is 721. Uh, 17, uh, we have uh, made 1,350 independent observations. And, you know, it goes on like that. So we've been uh, using this tool since uh, 2014. And the results have been very encouraging too, because uh, no, this actually enable us to uh, provide the information in a um, in a better way, you know, rather than having a single uh, statistics for just one month or uh, done during the a single count, 
you know, from the, uh, uh, across the months, you know, how the, um, um, the birds are monitored is, uh, could be, you know, demonstrated using this tool. So uh, uh, from January to December, you know, how this is monitored is very clearly, across the year is very clearly depicted in this graph. And the outcome of uh, uh, that kind of a monitoring is also very encouraging. I'll just cite a couple of examples. Uh, here, uh, this is for the pond heron. So uh, the graph on the left-hand side actually shows the frequency uh, of Indian pond heron in the, the whole checklist collected in 2014. So for example, in 2014, um, um, out of the total uh, checklist, uh, Indian pond heron account or uh, uh, found a mention in more than you know 60 percent of the checklist, and you know that pattern is more or less the same across the years. So this you know uh, statistically you know this becomes you know more uh, a sound way of uh, getting information than you know um, uh, we are uh, we have been doing you know until now as part of the Asian water bird census. And um, uh, it also gives a, um, or the graph on the right hand side shows about the uh, flock size. So in single uh, checklist, what has been the total number of, you know, pond heron that have been counted. So it varies between, you know, 20 to uh, 28 uh, across the years. So which also is a, a better indication of, you know, presenting the population. You know, similarly, we have data on the little cormoran and other taxa also. I'm not getting to the details of the other ones. Well, um, I, I spoke about the State of India, uh, but uh, the publication that was brought out uh, last year by uh, 10 uh, uh, lead institute across the country, including the Wildlife Institute of India, the BNHS, the, uh, the SACON, the ATRI, uh, and you know, the uh, uh, FES and uh, MOEF, uh, Natural Battles Authority. So all these, uh, you know, 10 organizations across the country has joined together and brought up this publication. So I'm just highlighting, you know, few uh, pages from that publication. This one is on the uh, water bird population uh, in India. So uh, they have done the analysis uh, pre-2000 to uh, 2018. So here we can see that uh, the migratory, I mean, all the uh, water birds, whether it is uh, resident birds, ducks and geese, gulls and terns and migratory shore birds, or have been showing a decline in their population over the last you know, two decades. So the trend um, uh, that, that I've uh, shown you uh, from the Kerala example is true at the national level also. And this is particularly true. You look at the blue map, which is on the uh, migratory shorebirds, where the population decline has been to the tune of close to 75%. So there has been a decline to the tune of 75% of the total population of migratory shorebirds in India over the last two decades, which is a really alarming one. And uh, in terms of you know, habitat uh, analysis also, the wetland habitat, which is uh, shown in this yellow line, there has been a decline to the tune of you know, close to 50% of uh, our wetlands have been lost over the last two decades. Uh, this is a as per the national level analysis done by the State of India Birds, uh, uh, which is a very recent publication that's come out last year. Well, um, um, uh, coming to, uh, specifically to uh, the uh, some of the habitats like you know shorebirds in India and the challenges that is being faced by our shorebirds. You know, um, um, shore uh, is one habitat uh, that is being greatly neglected. I would say amongst the wetland and you know it is one uh, habitat that would uh, have the most adverse impact of climate change because you know climate change when the sea level rises you know this would be one habitat that would be uh, uh, that will be losing um, um, at the at the first instance and you know this is happening it's not that you know, climate change is something that's going to happen um, five, uh, five decades uh, or, you know, 100 decades, sorry, 100 years later from now. No, it is not so. It's, it's already started happening and we are uh, losing this land. And, you know, we also should understand, you know, if you look at the protected area network of the country, uh, we do not have any protect or uh, 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 the, the percentage of the protected area. You know, we have, you know, close to six to 700 protected areas in the country. 
but you know uh, less than uh, uh, 5% or even low is a representation of our wetland habitat in our protected network so this is something you know that we need to address at the uh, national level and you know um, another uh, you know threat that is being faced by our coastal habitat is the uh, coastal afforestation practice that we have been you, you're doing both in the west as well as the east coast uh, by planting you know cashew reina uh, i mean you know this is something that has a lot of you know adverse impact on the habitat we are losing this habitat because of this deed and you know this is something that should be stopped at uh, at the uh, earliest instance itself if we want to you know protect our uh, uh, shore or the coastline habitat and coastline uh, um, we always you know tend to forget that you know it is one of the types of the uh, wetland as uh, defined by the ramsar convention so you know this is something you know that we need to uh, bear in mind and you know just to uh, take an example of you know one of the species of you know coastal uh, dependent bird the pacific garden plover again the data has been taken from the state of india's uh, bird report where you just see the population there has been a decline to the tune of more than 80% so some of these i mean you know we never did do such an analysis in the past so we did not know what's been happening to our birds but now we have a solid document in the form of the state of inner birds where it it clearly demonstrate what is each of our species how each of our species are faring across the country so you know if we do not take this as a lead and act now we will soon be you know at the greater disadvantage at the national level so this is something that i would like to flag to all the audience here and you know uh, this is true with you know other uh, water birds also cinnamon bittern uh, again you know close to 80% decline quarantine you know uh, or the cotton pygmy goose about which you know i spoke earlier uh, there is a decline to the tune of you know 60% uh, kingfisher pied kingfisher you know we all thought that this is one of the commonest bird in our uh, wetland habitat but you know see there is a decline to the tune of uh, 40% so you know our focus has always been on the, the iuc and uh, uh, red listed bird but all these species that i have listed here whose the bird that has been a population decline to the tune of you know 40 to 80% they are not you know uh, the ones that is threatened by the eyes and redis category so we tend to ignore or we tend to overlook uh, uh, our attention on to these species but you know soib the state of indian bird uh, clearly demonstrate you know the status of these uh, species in our country so there's something we need to address well the wetlands also face you know several challenges i will just highlight you know some of them reclamation this is very rampant that's happening you know i would uh, draw an example from kerala for example uh, we did have uh, some you know three fold until you know four decades back we did have close to 8 lakh hectares of paddy fields i repeat 8 lakh hectares of paddy fields thanks to activities like this now it has come down to less than 2 lakh hectares okay so vast majority of our wetlands is being lost uh, due to you know this kind of activities construction of roads to the wetlands you know it's it's also rampant the weed growth the change in the land use patterns you know from the uh, um, uh, you know the, the paddy to you know other uh, kind of you know uh, cash crops you know it's being changed you know poaching it is so extensively happening in our wetlands and you know we do uh, we don't even spare the you know schedule one species of uh, the wildlife protection act or we don't even spare the migratory species uh, which are you know uh, winged visitors that visit our uh, country from you know um, far off places like eurasia well uh, i would say that you know i'm, I'm concluding in uh, just two three slides i would say that you know, there has been a clear breach of conventions we are very good at you know signing uh, con conventions we have signed the ramsar convention we have signed the migratory species convention we have uh, uh, signed the uh, the biological uh, diversity act uh, the convention 
But, you know, I would say that now there has been a clear breach of all these convention. Uh, well, uh, in the initial uh, um, um, lecture, uh, Dr. Ritesh spoke about the policy interventions that government of India has brought in uh, by way of, you know, wetland conservation management rule of 2017 under the provisions of the Environmental Protection Act of 86. Well, it's an excellent uh, uh, act that's been notified by the central government way back in uh, 2017. But then, you know, uh, three years has lapsed. I would say very little action has been taken based on this extremely important, you know, legal provision. For example, um, one of the provisions of the conservation and management, um, uh, wetland conservation management rule of 2017 is the formation of the state wetland authorities. Yes, uh, many of the states, including Kerala, have constituted the state wetland authorities. I'm a member of that in Kerala. However, one of the mandate of the state wetland authority is the notification of the wetlands under the state wetland authority. You know, Ritesh also, you know, talk about uh, the, 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 the legal provisions of the do's and the don'ts as per this act. But then, you know, things, but for, to enact that, we need to notify the wetlands in each of these, each of our states using the provisions of the wetland conservation management rule of 2017. But then, you know, um, um, I don't think any of the states, definitely Kerala has not uh, uh, notified any of the wetlands uh, under the provisions of this important regulation enacted by the government of India. So, you know, this is something, you know, we need to, uh, uh, you know, pressurize our governments and get this implemented at the earliest so as to protect our remaining uh, wetland habitat, which we are fast losing. Um, so to conclude, um, we have to have management or conservation plans for our Ramsar sites. When I say this, I am aware that, you know, some of the management plans are available for some of the uh, some of the Ramsar sites. However, it's only remaining in paper, or it's only remaining as you see. One uh, major drawback with the Ramsar uh, sites and the Ramsar Convention is that uh, it is not legally binding from any government's part that you know it should be abided. Okay, now, if it is a protected area, unlike if it's a protected area, like it's a sanctuary or a national park or a uh, conservation or community reserve, you know, there is a implementing agency, uh, which is a forest department. However, in the case of wetlands, you know, that uh, provision has not been clearly assigned as on, you know, which is the department which should be managing uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, important landscape, important habitat has not been very clearly, it's, it's rather, it's very vague so that you know uh, the implementation part is you know very very poor and you know as i said you know more wetlands uh, should be particularly the coastal wetlands and you know the estuaries and the beaches and uh, the marine protected areas you know that kind of things you know should be brought in and uh, we should protect our uh, beaches shores and estuaries and we also should be doing long term monitoring of our wetlands so i mean long term monitoring i have uh, drawn the example from the core you know, since we have the data for the last three decades, you know, we know what's clearly happening in the coal wetlands, which is the Ramsar side. But then, you know, we do not have, you know, similar data from uh, what's majority of our wetland habitat. So, uh, you know, this is something, you know, um, that, you know, we should be um, uh, concentrating on. So I think uh, that's all. I once again take this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some of my experiences with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for uh, putting your words in terms of the overview of the wetlands, the types. I guess uh, we have almost diverse, uh, you know, all the type uh, types of wetlands which you have mentioned here in the talk. We have from uh, north of uh, India to the south of India. We must all these wetlands. You can say one way or the other way in different states. Thank you, sir, for uh, taking us to the Koli wetlands whereby uh, monitoring 
of water birds is uh, very important in conserving this uh, wetlands last year i have seen one study i think uh, it was done by wii <clears throat> wii regarding the uh, decline of abundance of uh, migrating birds the the what we have put around in most of the central india the power lines power lines also maybe you were also part of that study i don't know exactly that uh, power lines are also one of the reason that high tension lines are the, also the reasons for decline of these migratory birds but uh, thank you very much and nevertheless we uh, you are doing the good we appreciate all the works you are doing in front, in the field of wetlands family members of rani lakshmi bai and pandit university are highly thankful for your presence sir. thank you very much while we are going through the technical sessions if any participant and do have any questions they can just uh, write it down in the box maybe it, we can take some of the questions we can ask uh, our uh, distinguished speakers the uh, next distinguished distinguished to honor us with his presence is shri p shivar kumar chief conservation of forests and field director kaziranga national park assam Shri P. Shiva Kumar, a 2000 batch IFS officer, locally known as uh, Mr. Kaziranga, due to his efforts to protect Kaziranga National Park. This is because he executed a pending decision with government orders of expansion of the habitat, habitat from 430 square kilometers to 900 square kilometers in area. At Kaziranga National Park, he created six uh, wetlands to help. wild land access water and reduce man animal conflict in 2009 to appreciate his conservation works the world bank presented the officer with the national forestry award he got indra priyadarshini vrishka mitra award which is given by ministry of environment forestry and change government of india for his efforts towards conservation of endangered and endemic tree species under north assam circle he has been awarded with karm shri This is a Karm Shri Award. This is a Chief Minister's Award for Excellence in Public Administration. He is going to share us. Uh, she, he will share with us today uh, his field experiences and conservation challenges in wildlife habitats and wetlands. I would like to invite you, sir, to deliver your valuable talk. Thank you, sir. Any dear sir, Sri Kishor Kumar. Just, just contacting him, है ना? Just for a few minutes, just discuss, है ना? I am contacting. हाँ, ये ये ज्वाइनिंग है। राइट सर। हाँ, तानुष। डॉक्टर तानुष। हाँ। यस सर। हम्म। डॉक्टर पेशु कुमार ही ज्वाइनिंग। यस सर, आई बेट। Yes. Uh. Yeah, man. Can you see me? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. We welcome you. So, can we start the presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We were waiting. We have already cited uh, your citation already. And if you want, okay. I can repeat. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. And then you can meet other us. Uh, P. Shiv Kumar, a 2000 batch IFS officer, locally known as Mr. Kaziganga, due to his efforts to protect uh, Kaziganga National Park. Yeah. This is because he executed the pending decision with the government orders of expansion of 430 square kilometers to square kilometers in area. At Kaziganga National Park, he created six reserves uh, to help wildlife access water and reduce. ऑडेबल For his efforts towards conservation of endangered and endemic tree species, uh, sorry, uh, tree species under North Assam Circle, he has been awarded with Karam Shri Award. Uh, that is a uh, uh, Chief Minister's Award for Excellence in Public Administration. May I take this opportunity to invite you, uh, sir? Please deliver your uh, valuable talk. Uh, please unmute, Shiva. Please unmute yourself. PPT is coming up. Yes, sir. We can. Uh... Yes, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon to all. Uh, welcome to Kajiranga uh, through virtual mode. So I want to give you a brief presentation about uh, uh, Kajiranga National Park and Tiger Reserve. and our uh, recent initiatives mainly on uh, uh, water uh, water management and land conservation above the greenery portion is basically at the rhino bearing area the blue color is our brahmaputra river and the western side gray color is our uh, the brown color is our uh, kajanga under the kajanga tiger reserve we are also having a two wildlife sanctuaries called lako sanctuary and borachapur wildlife sanctuary basically kajiranga having a three administrations in case of administrations the tiger reserve we are having a three wildlife division the eastern assam wildlife division is the core area and the biswanath and nagaon is looking after the buffer area and nagaon territorial also handling one of the reserve forest which is under the tiger reserve apart from that we are having a five uh, adjoining divisions in kajiranga our the major problem is uh, straying out of uh, rhino tiger during the winter time and again during the monsoon times so we have to get the support from the neighboring uh, administration so, so for that we also give a monetary support for that we are we are included five five divisions such as, as a adjani division under the park authority in case of success stories it started way back in uh, 1905 when madam uh, mary curzon carson that time viceroy of uh, cousin he visited the kajiranga so there were lot of poachings then she suggested that the rhino bearing area should be brought under the government control kajiranga along with the manas and lauka was declared as a uh, proposed reserve forest area mainly for rhino conservation in 1908 it became a reserve forest and 1916 it became a game sanctuary and 38 we stopped that uh, regulated hunting then we this area was open for tourism in 1950 it became a wildlife sanctuary under the special act and 1974 this this area became a uh, national park uh, not under the indian wildlife protection act this under the assam uh, national park act in 1985 uh, this unesco declared the kajiranga as a world heritage site under two two criteria about the riverine management and the conservation of um, ret species rare and danger and threatened when this year declared as a heritage site then the government decided to expand the area from 
they added uh, six new additions areas they increased the area from 432 to 884 square kilometers even though area was in 1985 out of six additions only addition number 1 and addition number 4 we were in a position to take over uh, between 1985 to 2015 the remaining area so now the kajiranga landscapes increased to around 1900 uh, square kilometer last year we added uh, three more uh, new additions and current year also we put one more addition it means kajiranga original national park plus 10 numbers of additions four number of wildlife century and four number of uh, reserve forest the total land land mass area of 1300 square kilometers uh, area wise quite good enough we are we are targeting somewhere around 1500 square kilometers because we are handling around uh, 50000 plus herbivore the biggest population is um, hog deer we are having around uh, 35000 of hog deer populations apart from that uh, around 1000 plus uh, rhinos swamp deers 3000 plus uh, buffaloes and 121 numbers of tigers so it is a um, huge wildlife uh, base oriented habitat so it need a uh, lot of interventions mainly at the habitat levels we received world heritage uh, tag during 1985 and recently the government of uh, india declared iconic tourist destinations so this is the only site out of the 17 site which was declared as iconic tourist destination the only national park and we received the millennium award from the wwf and we received from award from the national tiger conservation authority for conservation of species other than tiger in tiger reserve about biodiversity kajiranga is very rich in biodiversity within 10 minutes you can we can get out of our uh, big five species except tiger there is a guarantee that within 10 minutes we can get sighting of remaining four species so in case of biodiversity we are having more than 555 plus uh, recorded plant species more than 38 mammal species we are very rich in uh, avian species and very rich in hepatophanato so this is the view of uh, woodland river and wetlands we know that the biodiversity in Kajiranga is quite high because we are having a culmination of different type of uh, ecosystems, our forest ecosystem, grassland ecosystem, wetland ecosystem. So every ecosystem is having its unique species because this uh, niche area is very narrow. So that is the reason that the diversity is in Kajiranga is quite high. Our prime species is uh, grassland area, around 40% uh, of the land under the grassland cover. And in case of uh, wetland, uh, in the past, the area under uh, wetland area around 9 persons means I am excluding the Dhamaputra river area because in total park area of around 1300 square kilometer it is almost 50 percent is our Brahmaputra river area itself it's also having a different types of islands temporary and uh, permanent islands so our grassland area in the past was around 40 and now it's reduced to around 27 percentage due to continuous erosion from the Brahmaputra side and the Kajiranga total tourism, we are handling somewhere around uh, 1,75,000 visitors uh, uh, in a year. And this year also, even within the COVID-related issues, still our uh, park, park, we got the visitor of around 1,25,000 visitors within last uh, three months. So our major uh, tourism activities mainly on this uh, big five species. All these big five are endangered species. Tiger, uh, rhinos, uh, swamp deers, uh, elephants, and uh, Asiatic water buffaloes. In case of management, year to 2007, the Kajiranga managements were only on tiger, only on rhino managements. In 2007, this area declared as a tiger reserve, and this area brought under the National Tiger Conservation Authority. So now we are having a three different type of management plans: a core area, buffer area, and corridor area for all this 1300 square kilometer area. Uh, in case of rhino, it's basically it need maximum corridor corridor connectivities and uh, coordination with the adjoining landscapes. But in case of rhinos, it need uh, proper management of wetlands. See, the rhino is one of the species you, you heard about a lot about animal uh, mortality during the monsoon times in Kajiranga National Park. We used to lose somewhere around 400 to 500 animals on an average in a year. Recently, this number has uh, brought under control due to uh, different type of uh, interventions. Rhino used to be there around 40 to 50 percent of their 24, 24 hours time life. They used to be in the wetland area. So the wetland management is very precious management in, in Kajiranga. The major threat uh, in wetland we are facing is like uh, the uh, siltations. 
because we are having um, multiple numbers of dams are coming up in china arunachal and even in assam so the water flow in the main brahmaputra areas got uh, irregular because we are getting the issue of this artificial flood animal know how to behave during the normal flood so whenever there is a artificial artificial flood they don't know how to so in such case the casualty used to be quite high in case of artificial flood the level also used to be used to be quite high we know that uh, wetland management means that uh, the major issue with the siltations simply going by desilting the wetland uh, mainly in kaziranga area we cannot give any permanent solutions because you know that kaziranga is basically a, if you want to see it's basically island island it's a, one of the biggest island of brahmaputra river brahmaputra so the top most style profiles mainly use so the basically sand bars so if you, if you use any machinery to do the desiltation work so there is no any guarantee that water will be retained after such type of interventions about our uh, population when we started this conservation uh, initiatives way back in 1905 that time our rhino population was uh, 24 so as per the recent estimations in 2018 our population is uh, 2430 so this is the graphs of popul populations starting from 1905 to 2018 so we can see that if we see the last uh, 10 years uh, estimations populations almost static so there is no much space to to increase the population so this is the time to the, this is the time we have to do the proper habitat management main power we are having good main power kajiranga is one of the unique uh, national park of our country which is basically armed by different type of security forces we are having assam forest protection force 1 assam forest protection force 2 special rhino protection force special task force and assam rangers force then our regular uh, home guard assam police and our foresters and forest guard it's a huge uh, manpower oriented uh, administrations with our sanction strength of around 1925 post in the assam the assam date we are having around 1600 manpower almost most of the guards they used to be to be provided arms not only to handle the poachers even for their self protection too our major activities is that protections Uh, monsoon management uh, kaziranga this uh, operation monsoon is the unique unique uh, unique unique operations i i told that our area is 1300 square kilometer during the monsoon times the whole kaziranga we can say that uh, around 90% of the area we can say is a wetland because the whole brahmaputra used to flow in the kaziranga main national park area so the whole area used to be under water almost for three months starting from uh, july then uh, once the monsoon is over then we have to There, be, there used to be a lot of damage based on the wave. Then we used to do the creation, maintenance, and management of tourist facilities. And we used to open the park in the month of uh, November. Sometimes, if if the if, uh, if there is a pressure, we used to open it in the month of October also. So main our uh, wetland related intervention we used to do in the month of uh, December, January, and grassland management we used to do in the month of February. uh this that's part of the habitat uh, habitat management and we are also having a good number of uh, eco development committee because you know that the rhino uh, uh, illegal horn trade is uh, single horn is fetching somewhere around 3 to 3.5 crores so even a local man if he can help the poachers they can get a payment of somewhere around 10 to 15 lakh so there is a huge pressure mainly on the poaching side uh, poaching side and government also very strict about cut to control the poaching we know that rhino poaching was more than 50 plus in the past uh, recently it reduced to uh, below to last year was the first time in the history of kaziranga we reduced the poaching to only two that was the last uh, last year cases even in the last year the first poaching cases we have seen that uh, involvement of uh, militants groups around eight numbers of militants they entered our area with the sophisticated arms like ak ak 47 56 ak 81 even the grenade because the amount is so high in this uh, business so that's why they are also ready to take the risk so to to control the poaching we have to take the community into uh, park management related intervention so we are involving around 90 numbers of eco development committees in uh, so eco development you said about in forest management we are having two type of community related intervention one is our joint forest management and another one is the eco development management 
joint forest management where uh, we used to share our forest area with the fringe villages they can do a, they can raise the plantations and whatever the outcome so there will be the sharing mechanism between the forest uh, forest department and the community in case of eco development it is mainly in the national park and wildlife sanctuary area so we cannot give our area for any community related intervention so in return what we used to do we used to do the eco development activities in the fringe area kaziranga is a basically is a river and landscape not only the park area, the whole fringe area also so basically this nagaon district we can this is the basically used to supply fish to whole northeast so the kaziranga also part of the same districts so what we are doing uh, through the eco development we are developing the wetlands in the fringe area not only in the our area in the fringe area also so recently we got the fund from our ministry ministry of environment, environment forest climate change under the national adaptation fund we got 24 crores uh, for uh, six sites six village sites to facilitate to, to to carry out about uh, wetland management and to and to carry out pisciculture organic farming because that is the only sustainable activities otherwise simply doing a community yard construction or renovation of school buildings even though that are uh, necessary activities but again it won't give any livelihood generation but in case of wetland it is basically a win combinations when when we are developing a wetland in the fringe area so that is ensuring the water availability in our our area also then again that wetland management basically supporting the livelihood activities of the fringe communities too I, I was telling that more than ninety percent of the area used to be wetland during the monsoon times, and the winter winter times our wetland area used to be reduced to uh, around forty uh, percent. Uh, in the case of our typical, if you are going to exclude the Brahmaputra and Reveren area, means our wetland area hardly around six percent only. There is a land land based wetland area. So there are a lot of discussion used to be there between the highland and wetland because we know that uh, due to the flood a lot of casualties uh, uh, in animals so we should go for more number of highlands in say the Kaziranga National Park. Now the issue is Kaziranga is basically known for wetland. When we are going to have, when we are going to promote highlands, so there is always a threat to wetlands. People used to suggest that uh, you do siltation desiltation in wetland. and dump this sale area that will act as a mount of highland but the limitation is this is basically sandy loam soil so whenever there is a high flood the river water uh, the flood water can sip the whole soil and it can be get dumped into the wetland area we need the wetland and again we need highland also so if you if you see the functions we know that uh, the type of uh, role played by the wetland in case of highland we simply we can say this is a relief camps so whenever there is any emergencies any flood or any natural calamities government used to open the relief camps that is hardly hardly for a one week or two weeks short period whereas our our residence is a permanent one so wetland is a permanent habitat and uh, highland is we can this a temporary nature so then uh, even though in the past uh, we have promoted uh, highlands then later we see that uh, this island also putting a uh, threat to the wetland it's not only in the name of siltation it is changing the water course during the high flood time so then we decided that we should not promote uh, wetland uh, we should not promote the highland instead of that we should try to promote the natural highlands and we should restore the all the corridor connectivities uh, in case of kaziranga kaziranga cannot survive without flood because we are having a huge number of permanent and uh, uh, seasonal wetlands so all this wetlands used to be get recharged Uh, during the monsoon times and the flood water also helping us to to keep this uh, ecosystem as a primary ecosystem basically the grassland area apart from that the flood water also used to clean and recharge all the water bodies and it should it, it is ensuring the nutrient cycling in all the wetland and it is in, again the flood also controlling is a population control measure these are the camps we used to now we can approach using the vehicle and the same camps during the monsoon time we can approach using the boats only so just think about what is happening to the wetland what is happening to the animal during the monsoon times so to handle to give a protection to uh, uh, animals during the monsoon time we plan to construct uh, highlands so this model we tried uh, during uh, 1980s and 90s so there were financial limitations the army helped us to construct small small island less than a acre uh, in most flood flood area it helped the animal also during the monsoon times 
So based on debt models with the support from the government of France, we have constructed 33 systematic new islands. It's basically reduced the animal casualties mainly in rhinos and buffaloes during the monsoon times. Apart from then, under the state plan, we also raised the existing road uh, of around 20 kilometers. Then recent year, now we are constructing six more highlands, but not in the park area, that is in the buffer area. And we are also basically heightening around 32 kilometers of our existing road network. So that will act like a road come highland uh, during the monsoon times. So this is the uh, photographs of um, uh, highlands which we have constructed during 80s and 90s. The heavy highlands adjoining to the wetlands. Limitation, you can see that the animal congregations during the monsoon times. So the limitation is in case of any disease to any animals. Now we are we are in the era of COVID era. So we use, we are talking about the social distancing. But in the name of highlands, we are ensuring that the population should be confined to a particular a small area. So then based on these studies, we decided to increase the highland size. So these are the new highlands we have constructed in the year 2017 and 18. These are the systematic highlands. But in all the photos, you can see the photos numbers one. So this is the wetland area. This is the wetland area. So everywhere there is a wetland in the, in the, in the, at the center, we put the highland. So during the normal flood, that thing's perfect. But in case of high flood, the highest flood we had in the year 1988. Whereas in last six years, we had so far managed to five highest floods. If the flood level increase more than 1988 flood, and even this island cannot protect the animals. So in such case, uh, we will lose the animals. And again, this animal, this islands can be shifted and this soil can be dumped in the neighboring wetland area. There is a major threat to the wetland. So that's why we decided that uh, we should not construct any more highlands inside our core area of the Kajiranga National Park. So this is the usage of uh, highlands during the monsoon times by rhinos. The another pictures, you can see the single highlands used by more than six plus rhinos uh, during the monsoon time. So this is the uh, watershed map of Kajiranga National Park. So, so total area is full of wetlands. So this, uh, the, the blue color area is our Brahmaputra River. And next is the core area. And south of uh, the core area is a uh, watershed area of Kajiranga. So the administrative issue is this watershed area is not under the administrative control of the Kajanga director. This area, it is under the autonomous council. Like in Assam, we are having a state uh, within state concept. We are having a three autonomous council, the Karbianglam council, Dima Asau, and uh, Bodo, Bodo land uh, territorial regions. So three council, the forest subject is basically handled by the council. So there are administrative related issue also when we are working in the such type of landscapes. So now there are a lot of discussions going on whether we have to promote highland or not. Then if you are going to promote highland, what will happen to the wetland? So then we decided that uh, we should not construct uh, any more uh, highland inside, whereas we'll try to manage the wetlands and we'll go for uh, management of uh, natural highlands, which is on the southern side of uh, Kajiranga National Park. But that area under the Karbianglang Autonomous Council area. So recently we had a meeting with them. Then we have suggested the area bordering with the Kajiranga Tiger Reserve area can be declared as a buffer area under Kajiranga Tiger Reserve, or otherwise they can go for uh, independent Tiger Reserve also. So they agreed to have an independent Tiger Reserve, but it's still in the, in, the, in the initial stage only. So if we can notify the area, proposed area somewhere around 500 uh, hard square kilometer area. That will help us to manage the wetlands inside the, the park area and the uh, land between the park in the Karbanglang Council area, which is under the control of the villages. So now we are gradually moving from the, in case of wetland management from our area, we are we already moved to the fringe area, community area. So now we are moving from the community area to the watershed area. So if you see the watershed area, uh, the total watershed area of around 3,500 square kilometer. But if you go by the park area, it's hardly only 1,300 square kilometer. So basically in this all these issues, the court is basically helping us. There are three famous uh, court orders from different courts. The first order we got it from the National Green Tribunal. This is about uh, 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 controlling of uh, vehicle, which is moving on the southern side of Kajiranga National Park and to reduce the uh, animal casualties due to the speeding vehicle during the monsoon times. I told you that now our uh, area under submergence maybe in the name of wetland or uh, Brahmaputra, it's around 40 persons. And during the monsoon time, it will increase to 90 persons. In such time, the animal used to move 
from north to south so the national highway is passing through the park area the total length of around 64 km and the identified corridor area 38 km falls under the nine corridors so there is to be a uh, animal casualties due to the vehicle hit then the national green tribunal intervened then they suggested that uh, during the monsoon times we should ensure that the strict uh, speed uh, restriction and we should go for a construction of elevated road and we put the animal sensor also so that project is started we have already one sensor is installed and uh, four more uh, sites oriented uh, sensor work is go going on so the, the advantage is whenever the animal is moving during the monsoon time the sensor will detect the animal movement it will change the signal so the automatically the traffic will be halt once the animal is moved from the corridor area the traffic will be allowed so that is the system we are trying it the another major order is uh, high court order a honorable guwahati high court order i say that uh, when this area was declared as a uh, world heritage way back in 1985 then the government increased the area from 432 to 885 square kilometer but only addition number 1 and 4 handed over to the park the remaining area people occupied and the government was not in a position to evict them and to hand out such area to us the finally guwahati high court has taken the somota case way back in 2012 they issued the order to to evict the encroacher from the from the protected area and to hand over the area to the park authority control so even though order was passed in 2015 finally it was implemented uh, last year only we can say that almost 99% of the orders implemented only hardly around 700 uh, 7 square kilometers still pending so we expecting that we will get those area also the another uh, biggest order is our honorable supreme court order so this is a, this is for the landscape directly we can support the for watershed management they stop the mining activities in whole this 3500 uh, square kilometer area watershed so we can't do a mining and uh, even on the corridor area which is a 30 kilometer stretch Uh, on the southern side even on the private land the people can't do any construction we can't do any we can't do any tourism related activities also the supreme court put the order then they suggested that we should go for a corridor management we have to identify the area we have to go for a purchase of that land so that work is going on so about the uh, ecosystem uh, service of wetland in kajiranga the total kajiranga it's not only the species our total tourism activities also basically relying on wetland only every national park every range we are having a different size of uh, wetland the eastern range the biggest wetland is uh, sohala wetland that is around 600 square kilometer area so based on the wetland only we are we are doing the tourism so out of the 1300 square kilometer our tourism area is 7% area in 7% area so only we have identified big wetlands so along the wetlands we develop the road net, road network and we are we are doing the proper man management of such type of wetland but in case of other wetland in other area Uh, we are not in a position to do mainly due to the flood and siltation related issues and the service uh, fresh water supply food biodiversity flood control ground water recharge maintaining the water cycle climate change mitigations and another major financial support we are getting from the wetland is our eco tourism so kajiranga uh, tourism business somewhere around 1000 uh, crore odd business and the park only from the entry fees we are charging only 100 100 rupees we are getting around 555 crore as a revenue we are getting on an average of 175000 visitors that include around 10000 plus international visitors also so these are the different species uh, using our wetlands mainly in case of mammals the prime species is the rhinos and elephants and in case of birds we are getting good number of migratory birds uh, last two season we have done the waterfowl census also in all our wetland area so that's the record shows that around 80 to 90000 uh, individuals uh, of 27 species basically visiting our area during the winter time and again in case of fish diversity kajiranga is a basically it's a, we used to say this it's, it's a maternity ward mainly for fish uh, up to bangladesh because in the other area kajiranga controlling around 150 kilometers of uh, brahmaputra river so the breeding activities used to take place in the kajiranga area and during the monsoon time the surplus used to be moved to, uh, towards the down area means west so kajiranga is supporting the fish diversity from the kajiranga park area up to bangladesh this is some of the photographs of our wetlands in case of number we are having perennial locally is called wetlands or beals we are having around 119 numbers of wetland and seasonal around 190 wetlands and streams and major rivers we are having around uh, 55 so this is the sohala wetland where you can see that uh, different species using the same wetland
and we also recorded uh, some unique uh, globally threatened species which we are uh, using our wetland area they used to come during the winter migrations and out of uh, 12 species of uh, 17 uh, species of turtles and tortoise the main dependent wetland species are around 12 species which are using our wetland the major threat to wetland in kajiranga is uh, siltation due to the flood we we know that uh, during the monsoon times start somewhere in june and the high flood season used to be there uh, three months july august september so most of the wetland get inundated the brahmaputra river used to carry quite huge amount of silt so there is issue issue related to siltations the natural aging related issues water ice in this one of the major issues then the mining activities mainly on the southern sites so during the monsoon times Uh, the river used to carry the, all this uh, overburden material which were dumped in the mining area and it used to be get deposited in the uh, our wetland area then the erosions kajiranga uh, in last uh, 60 years uh, we have lost uh, somewhere around uh, 80 km of our prime habitat even though brahmaputra river added around 150 new areas but we have lost around 80 square km because this is a basically we can say this this is a shifting habitat so the management also is basically more of a annual management than about the perennial permanent management so recently we developed uh, the potali bill this is not the park area this is basically a part of uh, kukrakata reserve forest so those area those times there was a lot of mining activities and illegal fellings so recently we brought this area aur kya madhyam hai share karne ka bas bhai ye mera call pe In 2001, this area was handed over, and the current year we started to develop this area. Yesterday we had wetland day celebration in Kottayam only. So I think we can over almost after that we started to develop this area. Sir, बच्चे तू ही कर दे. Webinar मेरा जाएगा. Manmohan, yeah. this uh, bandar dubi this land we have taken over from the uh, encroacher almost after 110 years and uh, everyone eagerly waiting for whether this area is going to be used by animal or not because all last 110 years uh, in the first notification this area was under our control later this area was de reserved for various reason again it's a good fight finally we have taken over this area last year and now this land in this area we developed three wetlands and now this area is used by variety of our annual species there are already around 17 rhinos the best comments i received from my uh, dfos because my dfo was telling that we are having a quite vast area under our park control why we have to wait for bandar dubi that to for last 110 years what is the speciality of uh, this area then i was telling that bandar dubi this is the one of the stable wetland area where we don't have much issues due to the brahmaputra flood related issues at any cost we have to take we have to bring this area under control after almost 110 years fight by different officer in different generation finally we have taken over the area last year now it is used by around 17 rhinos uh, two tigers the area is hardly 3 is uh, 300 hectare but it's uh, having a good number of wetlands so now there is a good demand that this area also should be open for tourism even though we allowed only for the fringe communities who were supported us in this uh, process then we are we are developing a deopan area these are the recently taken over area deosur area and chirakwa these are the newly taken over area and wetland is already developed then the animal also started to use it then another major two uh, biggest habitat is sohala habitat and donga in these two area what we are doing it basically in most of the uh, wetland area we decided that post monsoon we used to plug all the exit points so in that way we want to retain the water uh, additional water so that can help us during the winter time it's helping us so wetland management is gradually getting a attention in our park management because in the past kajiranga park management is basically rhino protection oriented and grassland management but in case of wetland management we couldn't give a proper attention but recent uh, recent day we have seen that lot of issue is basically coming up mainly with the water table you know that Uh, the south of kajiranga kajiranga we are having the township where in the past the water table used to be hardly 20 feet but now the water table is uh, depth is somewhere around 130 feet the people are also realizing it's everybody is supporting us in our uh, restoration process thank you
Thank you, sir, for your kind and uh, enlightening talk. You are uh, working in different uh, spheres of Kandaranga National Park in terms of protection, uh, management, tourism, habitat management, and eco development. Uh, now you have introduced also technology, advanced technology in uh, your national park. So, and at the same time, you are doing the legal activities. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Now, at the same time, you have taken up the, the I guess, the assignments of legal activities. And this is really sometimes for the field work, this is really hectic sometimes to do all this. And we appreciate for your efforts in this field. And uh, you have summed up very nicely the provisioning uh, services or the regulating services, whatever uh, this Kazakhstan National Park is providing. You have highlighted also the, the threats of this incredible uh, national park. We are highly thankful to you for taking time out from your busy schedule for this noble cause. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, uh, sir, uh, should we continue or we are going to... No, actually we not informed him, no, so I think we, we will join later on only. Though I tried to contact him, but uh, later on only. So, uh, thank you, uh, uh, P. Shukumar. <laughs> yes, thank, you. My... Uh, thank you, Manmogan. Uh, dear participant, Manmogan is my college mate during our uh, college days in Forest College and Research Institute, Metropolitan. And we are very close together uh, during our uh, MSc period, uh, MSc that uh, course period. <laughs> Thank you, and he accepted my invitation. I just to uh, our dean sir uh, would like to comment because he also served in Pasigar six years as a dean uh, that College of Horticulture Forestry. So he may like to comment on your presentation also. Okay, sir. Yeah, please. Thanks, Dr. Manmohanji, uh, Dr. Sishankar Saab has given excellent presentations and uh, I was listening every point. The way he is addressing to this your problems and not only this your current problems, he is um, uh, such a visionary person that he is uh, taking what steps should be taken to this your evaluate such type of this your solicitation, such type of this your coaching and uh, how this your every time there is a very challenging task due to this your uh, changes of discourse up to this your Brahmaputra river. And uh, wetland itself is the very much problematic concept. So in that order, he is making every effort and the way he has generated to this your revenue and the way he has given to this your uh, uh, good work, uh, I am having very much appreciations and I wish that under his dynamic leadership, the program will get a newer height for um, conservation purpose and such a part to this your everyone cause and even cause part to this your such a very noted sanctuary of not only India but has uh, uh, got a impetus and has got a very uh, reputation into this your worldwide. So once again, thanks, Sushankar Saab. Very excellent presentations you have given. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words, sir. And uh, please visit Kajiranga sometime. For your invitation, certainly. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Sir, should we continue or we resume after lunch? I think we resume after lunch because uh, uh, a speaker uh, I'm not able to contact. Uh, no, maybe. Dr. Prashant is already getting online. He like to continue? I don't know, sir. If you are, uh, sir, maybe you can. Uh, Dean, sir, should we continue or we? Make a break for a lunch. Sir, you are not audible, sir. You are not audible, sir. We are as per the direction of Dr. Manmohan. <laughs> <laughs> so we will uh, we will join later. Okay. Okay, okay sir. Uh, so, around, uh, what time? 2.30? 2.30. 2.30, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be joining back at uh, 2.30 and we expect all of you uh, back. We are having uh, very interesting uh, uh, speakers left and uh, we'll have a lot of uh, enriching information today. Thank you all of you. Thank you for your patience. Hello.
हाँ कल सुबह चलना है और मैं आपको लोकेशन और सारी चीजें मैं दे दूंगा थोड़ी देर में ठीक है ना ओके धन
Sometimes we're ready. No.